<laughs> it's reaching in right now. <laughs> Welcome to Bash University Live, uh, everybody. We're getting uh, silly before the show starts. Uh, it, it's a lot of fun being here. I hope you guys enjoy it. I appreciate you guys being with us. We're going to be talking fishing for the next hour and a half or so. And excited about our guest today, a young man that has lit it up out on the Bassmaster Opens, the EQ points champ, dominated. Really, uh, JT Tompkins um, really extended his lead in the last tournament. It's just uh, really an impressive year overcoming uh, a lot of different conditions and different types of body of water. A nine tournament trail. Uh, that's that's a big deal. That's a lot of tournaments um, and a lot of different conditions to overcome and get that W. Uh, and he's, well, I guess he's on his way to the elites. We're going to be finding out what are his plans. I'm assuming he's going to, uh, you know, accept that invitation as are probably most of the top 10. So looking forward to talking to him about that. So get your questions together, uh, get over there on bashu.tv, get yourself subscribed. We have Crankenstein special going on tonight, Justin, or this week, what, what, you get a really cool crankbait prize uh, for subscribing annually at Bash U. That's right. We got uh, two OG Roccos and an OG Slim. I know, Pete, you like messing around with those crankbaits. I, I and, do. Uh, you get a Bash U hat with a subscription. So awesome. check that out. Some get of the two of my favorite crankbaits on the market. Good time of year for the crankbaits, too. It is crankbait season uh, in the fall. And uh, so that's going on right now. Go get yourself subscribed because uh, we give away prizes to our subscribers. We have a, a great grand prize that we give away each show. And uh, so pay attention. We're going to be talking about a, a immense amount of stuff today with JT, I imagine. So we're, we're going to pick something from the show. And, and uh, if you get that right, we have a great prize. Jocelyn, what's our prize? It's actually the same thing as our Crankenstein. So since our members, they get a chance to win the... Crankenstein special. Ah, nice. that's very cool. Very cool. So you can get an extra set of crankbaits, which is that's important. Which is awesome. Got to have, have an extra many. set. Yeah, <laughs> you can never have too many. And and if you're if you insist on loafing over on social media, <laughs> like and share the <laughs> feed loafing. over there. And uh, and we have a cool prize for you for our like and share contest. What's that prize? We have a hummingbird hat and a set cool. of power. Baits, I think they're called. Nice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's a Max Sense. Max Sense. Uh, yeah, they're a big deal. They're a big deal, Joss. That's okay. key. But uh, <laughs> it's good to have you back in studio, Rich. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a while. I feel like I haven't been here in, I don't know. It's been, been, couple been, of days, a, yeah, it's been a couple of days, couple of months. Yeah. Um, been on the road a lot. We've been doing some cool stuff. Um, we've been filming. Um, Last week, we were down at Watts Bar Lake. We were filming with some of the Major League Fishing anglers. Uh, we shot seminars with Brandon Coulter, with Fletcher Shryock, Jonathan Van Dam, Nick Hatfield, and John Hunter. Excellent. So stay tuned uh, for those seminars. They're going to be they're going to be heading your way. They're going through the editing suite right now with uh, the man behind the curtain, Jeff Olson. He's uh, dropping Bash University gems as always. And guys, right now we are actually live with ticket sales for all of our in-person seminars. All of our classes yes. are set right now, yep. so go check it out. Yep, you can get your you can get your your tickets for the classes this year currently right now uh, on the website. Just go over there and, and buy the tickets, and we're already filling up some of the instructor slots as well, guys. Um, a couple of names just to throw them out there at you. Uh, we have Professor Professor Cruz coming back, uh, a good friend of the Bash University program, awesome instructor, John Cruz. Uh, he's going to be with us down at Anderson, South Carolina, uh, as well as a uh, as well as a couple of couple of other guys um, that are going to be joining us as well. Uh, Nick Hatfield, a young gun out on the Major League Fishing Tour, qualified this year, won a Major League Fishing Tackle Warehouse Invitational this past year on the Potomac River by a big margin. Um, and he's just a real stick. He's uh he's he's been in this game for a little while now, and he's he's making waves on the MLF side of things. So we're excited to be working with him. And uh, we got Brandon Coulter joining us as well uh, at the Anderson, South Carolina Bash University seminar. Uh, Brandon's a veteran in this sport. He's an awesome instructor. I can't wait to craft his topics. It's going to be really good. 
And then uh, also the next one after Anderson, South Carolina, the following week, we're going to be down there in Athens, Texas, which is a hotbed for bass fishing. So stay tuned for some names there. Uh, we're going to be putting them out here real shortly. Um, but it's going to be another fun year in the classrooms, Pete. I, I cannot wait to get back in the classrooms, belly to belly, chest to chest with all of our Bash University family and uh, learn some more about bass fishing. So. And, and you can bet the, you know, we work hard to deliver the guys that are, uh, you know, some of the most talented anglers on the planet and crafting seminars that really are cutting edge. That's that's what we do, and we pride ourselves on that, and you can look for that at every single event. So it's an early bird special going on right now. Get over to thebashuniversity.com. Uh, I think, it's, what, what's it, a 15% off right now yes. for early bird special? Uh, take advantage of that. That's going to end this week. And um, um, so come on out. And, it, and guys that were in Texas with us last year, we got to put. We're working on it. We want to have a, a bash you meet up again this year. We're yes. going to be doing it on Lake Athens. We're we're we'll keep you guys posted. We're leaving Jocelyn in charge of the ice storms, the weather, Mother uh, Nature, Mother yes. Nature. If you're listening, please. <laughs> no ice storms. Although it was fun, you I, know, to a yeah. certain extent, but um, no ice storms. We yeah. want to fish Lake Athens and actually yeah. be able to feel our extremities. <laughs> it was it was rough, but now they say the big ones bite in the ice, and that may be true. But we couldn't get the boats to the lake, so it, you know it didn't matter to us. So just a little bit less ice this year, that would be great. Yeah. Get get you come on out and join us at Bass University this year. It's going to be a blast, guys. Uh, so so much going on in fishing. We're if you're just tuning in, JT Tompkins is with us. Uh, the elite or the EQ points champion uh, really had an amazing year. He's going to be on. We're going to be talking to him about this year and next year, what what it's looking like for him after winning those points. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with JT. leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. Aquaview. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod. 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out during a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming Series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I've found that can withstand my hook set. Boom, goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Cortland Line Master Braid, America's premium super braided fishing line. Manufactured in our Cortland, New York facility and constructed from the highest quality spectra fibers available. Cortland Line Company, made in America since 1915. Why well, I have 
have to have the best eyewear. My eyes are essential to doing my job. It's the highest quality lens that I've ever used. Top of the line performance in these glasses. But they're priced for absolutely everyone. The everyday angler can afford them. As a touring professional pro, if I can depend on them, I know the weekend angler can as well. Hobie Eyewear, built for the pros. Price for everyone. It ends today. Welcome back to Bass University Live, uh, brought to you by Tackle Direct Studios. By the way, there is a clearance canyon sale going on at Tackle Direct. Uh, tremendous discounts across the board on things like uh, Aquaview cameras and many other amazing things. So go over there and check it out at TackleDirect.com. Everything's on sale. Ends today. Ends today. So go check it out. Um Man, this is really cool. Uh, you know, we've got a we've got a young man that has just lit it up. He's had a so much in such a short period of time uh, that's that's going well and doing extremely well. We're excited to have him on the show. We've uh, we've had him on before. Uh, we had him on when he put the beat down on me and you, yeah, on the Chesapeake, yep. and he got that dub last year. And he follows it up this year by winning the EQ points. So really excited to have him with us today is JT Tompkins, the points champ from the EQs. How are you, buddy? I'm doing awesome. How about y'all guys? Man, we're doing great. We're doing great. We're still licking our wounds from last year on the Chesapeake, though. I got to be honest with you. <laughs> still stings a little bit, just a little bit. But uh, but that was a great win. And uh and it was, you know, I guess it, we shouldn't be surprised to see you have such, you know, such great success uh, after getting that W. Uh, you know, things just, you know, kept rolling your way uh, tournament after tournament. I know there was a lot that was going on, but, uh, you know, we talked before the show. You, you took a little break. I guess you got to, you got to finally breathe a little bit. The pressure's off and uh, take a little vacation. Absolutely. It was uh, not a little bit different than winning one tournament, you know, all the pressure and everything stacking up when you got the EQ points, you know, there's pressure built up from the very first tournament or even as soon as the, sch the schedule comes out all the way into the last tournament. So it was a full year of stress relieved at that one tournament. Once I finally won angler of the year and, um, just super happy to be finally done with this year and onto the, onto bigger things at the elite. So super excited about that. Well, it's, uh, you know, that that is there's a lot to talk about there we got a lot to unpack so uh let, let's go let's go into it and um you know do you have this um, tremendous success where did this come from like what what were how did you get to this level it's not it's so hard to do and you're making it look easy did you have a mentor uh how where where did you where did you begin in uh as I, I, I see your eyes rolling, did you almost get smashed by a tractor trailer? No, there's a guy driving by me on the side of the road. And, um, <laughs> but I well, guess we, where all the success came from, or sorry, go ahead. No, nah, no, nah, we need you to keep safe, right? So <laughs> make sure you're in a safe spot. No, we can't we're have, good. We're good. we can't have the EQ champ, uh, get in trouble, but, uh, all right. So let's take, take us there. How'd you get started? Who, who was your mentor? How'd you get, how'd you get this good? Yeah, so it all kind of started, I mean, when I was four years old is when it started. I mean, I started fishing the first time. I think I fished my first tournament at four years old with my dad. You know, I, I can't remember if it was at Watery. It was a Toys for Tots tournament at Watery. So I guess that's where it all started. And um, it progressed from there. Me and my dad ended up fishing team tournaments in the um, Low Country Team Trail. And we ended up being back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back three times in a row, Angler to Year champions when I was – I don't know, like 10 to 13 age. And then once we kind of got to that point and we felt like we had the local area kind of understood, my dad knew that if I wanted to pursue bass fishing, it needed to make, he needed to make a step up himself to the FOW tour. So he signed up to fish the co-angler side for two years. And then, you know, once he did that, he actually hopped up and fished professionally on the FOW tour. And then I fished co-angler on the FOW tour you know, alongside of him fishing professional. And then we went from that and then we went to the Bass Opens 
and then we kind of progressed all the way through that. So that was kind of our progression, tournament progression all the way through. But ever since 16, I've been fishing professionally, you know, out the front of the boat from Toyota Series, BFLs, anything. And then also fish co-angler on the tour, co-angler on the um, some Toyotas and stuff like that. Then I started fishing the Bass Opens. But ever since 18, I've been on the water probably 300 plus days of the year, every single year. And that's what's got me to where I'm at is time on the water strictly. So, man, that's, that's where a, it all comes from. Yeah, that, well, that's a tremendous amount of time on the water. Uh, at 16, you were a boater. Like you were, you jumped out of the. I guess you couldn't be even a co angler before that, right? So you you jumped right into the front of the boat. Yeah, well, I did both. I, I fished co angler on the tour. At the same time that I was fishing, I fished a few BFL regionals. I fished a Toyota. I, actually, my first ever top 10, I think I was 16 years old when I made my top 10 as a boater on the Toyota series on Potomac River. So that was wow. that was a pretty big step up for me. And then I think I had a top 10 that year as well at um, Lanier, Georgia. And a BFL, re- We're not. I don't know if it's a region. It was a super tournament. It was a two-day super tournament. And I had a top 10 there at 16 as well. And that was kind of where it all started. But I mostly fished co-angler those years. You know, in high school, I would leave. I would fly out to all these FLW tour events. And that's kind of how I got my start, fishing alongside my dad. Well, that's – so your dad was obviously a a major uh, influence in in helping you along with this. And, man, what what an amazing mentor and – experience that that must have been to be able to travel and do all that getting exposed all these bodies of water with your father uh man i i I hope i get to do that with my son someday yeah it was uh i've got to be the luckiest person alive to have the opportunities that i've had because there's not many people that's ever had the opportunities that i have and um when you look at the opportunities that i've received it's it's pretty clear how i've gotten to where i'm at because I think a lot of people could really get to where I'm at if they had the opportunities I had. So I, that's where my success comes from is the people that have been around me, not exactly me. It's just the people who have given me the opportunity to do what I do. So it's a big thanks to all those people. And it's definitely been, you know, I probably can't even truly realize or understand the opportunity that I do have. And I just try to be as thankful and work as hard as I possibly can every single day to return the favor in a way, if I ever could do that. Well, I think that's, you know, that's a big deal because, yeah, all right, you've had some opportunity there, but you've you've made the most of it. You put the work in, um, you know, you put the time in, and uh, and that's, you know, that's what separates uh, everybody. And it's amazing the people that – so many people that are successful always say that what you said. They say, you know, I'm lucky, uh, you know, that I had this or that or the other. And and I think that plays a plays a factor in a, in a lot of things, but man, it it when it comes down to it, it's I think it's about putting the effort in and having that desire and having that just I mean, three hundred days a year is a lot of days on the water. That requires a tremendous amount of determination, and you can see it all over you. Determination is I if I had to if I looking from the outside, I'd have to say that's probably one of your best assets. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to claim to be a very smart angler or, you know, anything along those lines. I just feel like I have the ability to put my head down and grind and work extremely hard, like not during tournament week. It's not daylight dark during tournament week. It's daylight to dark every single day. And that's really been my motto. That's what I've had ingrained in me by my parents since I was, you know, very young. Like if you're going to do it, you got to do it 100 percent and there can't be any room for error. And you know, that's, that's the way I've been taught my entire life. So that's the only thing I really know. So, you know, I feel like work ethic is my number one asset to me. And that's one thing that I know I can keep going for a long time. So I'm, that's really the number one thing I have going for me is number one, I'm opportunities. And number two, I feel like I have a really good work ethic from my parents that I've been able to carry over to bass fishing. I could see it in your fishing. How old are you now, JT? 21. 21 years old. That's amazing. You know, uh, it reminds me, uh, Zell Rowland. Are you, do you know who Zell Rowland is, <laughs> JT? I, actually, I fished at Smith Lake, Alabama. 
I actually fished co-angler with him on Smith Lake, Alabama in the FLW Tour, and I got to meet him for the first time at that tournament. So I actually know him very well. Well, I just remember his story is, is your story, uh, starting at 16, um, getting driven to uh, to tournaments. There's a few guys that that have done that, but it's uh, wow that you, you actually got to to fish with one of the you know one of the superstars of the sport, and you guys kind of share the same path. Yeah, it was a. Uh, I didn't realize it then, but I realize it now how big of a interesting happenstance that it was for me to draw him in that tournament and to be where I'm at now. Like I haven't talked to him since, but I remember that day it was, it was a day that I, I look back, like it wasn't special that day. I, I couldn't realize how special it was that day, but I look back at it now and I realize how amazing it was to have that opportunity and to have that story built into that day and to look back at it all the time. is just super awesome. I, I enjoyed fishing with him so much that day was a special day for sure that i always remember well big shout out to to zell Rowland, um who knew he was going to get in the mix here but uh you've uh you've you've got a lot of exposure with your father great mentor uh fishing uh, you know a lot of uh you know a lot of influence around you know on all these different bodies of water what a you're taking on this tournament trail i mean you got you're all over the place too. You're all different types of bodies of water, all different types of challenges. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced this year? Um, my biggest challenge was probably Ufala, Alabama. Like that was it was my first tournament of the year, and it caught me off guard really big because I understand brush pile fishing and I love brush pile fishing, but I definitely missed the side of it of the ledge fishing. I didn't know that. You know, pre-spawn, they live on ledges, and post-spawn, they live on ledges. I I was very naive to a lot of things in that tournament, and when I look back at that tournament, I, I see all my mistakes. So that was probably my biggest tournament that I made my most mistakes in was that one. So I would have to say that you fall Alabama was my toughest tournament. Looking back now, I feel like I could I could really rewrite the script and do a lot better, but, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty, and you can't do that. You just got to go look back and, and make sure you try not to make that mistake again, so... Yeah, so the, the the so the mistake was not you know identifying ledges as pre-spawn areas. And yes, that and I I probably ended up rush like it's famous that you know fishermen rush the fish like they're second we get a seventy degree day we're oh they're spawning on the bank it's so when really they were still in their wintering spots so mm-hmm. that was that's another thing that I probably did. I probably rushed the fish. I said they were going to be on ledges when they weren't. And also I didn't realize that ledges played so much in the pre-spawn. I thought it was mostly just a pre-spawn thing, you know, May 1st to June the 1st to July the 1st, you know, those from May to July, I thought that was when the ledges went down, but little did I know that ledges were going down in that tournament. And I kind of just, I fished my brush piles, you know, Kind of got near the spawning areas and i worked my way out and i found brush piles closest to them as i could and that was the pattern that i ran to get 48 that i but you know I, I definitely could have made a lot of adjustments that tournament to you know enhance that finish so i look back at that one as a learning experience for sure heck yeah i mean we all do i mean local guys probably had that dialed but you know when we're watching it from afar uh, i've fished there a couple times they always send us there in may and june Right. So, you know, we know the ledges play that time of year. Uh, I, that's the first big tournament that I've seen there in, in the preschool, you know. So it, it, it caught a lot of people off guard, I imagine. And, but uh, you was that your worst tournament of the season? Yeah, that was my worst tournament of the season. And um, I was kind of, you know, it was about I, every single year. My first tournament's always my worst tournament every single time for some reason. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because I'm rusty or, or what it is, but that's definitely seems to be the case. And usually I get better as the year goes on. And I just happened to have a good finish my first tournament and got better from then on. So I guess that's a good thing. We'll see. Hopefully next year I can make it in the top 20 and never leave the top 20. So I doubt that's going to happen, but that's definitely yeah. going to be my outlook on the next few years is hopefully I can keep that train going. So you're, so your your second tournament of this of the year, and we're not talking opens here. The second tournament of the year was the Bassmaster Classic that you fished. Yeah, and, that was. Uh, 
I mean, you had it. You you had a you had a solid finish. You came in twenty fourth place. How did that finish in the classic and just walking across that stage and being there? How much did just the feeling of knowing you belong affect the rest of your year? Because I mean, after that tournament, you you rolled, dude. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard to explain the feeling of the classic without, you know, someone being there because like something I've always heard of, you if things get overhyped, you know, you, they, you go to it and it's just not what you thought it would be. But the classic is the one of the only things I've ever seen hyped up so much and it still didn't meet the hype. Like it was that like the hype didn't meet up to the classic. Like the classic blew away every every expectation I had. And I remember every tournament morning, you'd, you'd back down, like, I mean, 21-year-old me who hasn't had many things going for him, backing in next to Jason Christie, backing into Gussie. I actually <laughs> stayed in the house. I was I stayed in the same house as Cooper, Gallant, and Gussie during the entire practice week. So I got to stay in the house with the classic champion that week and just wow. watch how that week unfolded. And I look back at everything from that week and, it gives you, like, when you back in next to Jason Christie's and Greg Hackney's and all these guys that are, you know, the best in the world, like, top of the line, it gives you the confidence that you can go out there and do it, too, and that you belong, especially when you go out there and you hold your own. You know, the Bassmaster Classic is arguably the most competitive tournament because I, don't, I think everyone would agree that elite guys probably put more preparation and more hard work into the Classic than any other tournament arguably and to hold your own against those guys in a tournament where you know they're giving 100 percent, no doubt if not 110 that meant a lot to me and i knew that if i i had a shot at doing this for a living and that was that was kind of the spark that i needed to tell myself that i can do it like no matter what happens in the future i can do it and that i just need to keep my head down and keep grinding so it was definitely a big turning point in the season Bassmaster Classic. It's a big, it's a big derby. As a matter of fact, we just saw um, Hall of Famer George Cochran at uh, at Ike's induction, and um, I, I, George famously, you know, said that the tournament fishing is all about the classic. It's all that it, it's all about it. Like his entire career was spent, you know, preparing for the next classic, and he's got two. Two classic wins. He's one of very few that have multiple uh, classic wins. But he echoes what you just said about everybody that that this is the deal because you win that tournament and you are a household name and you you are burned in uh, you know in the memory of this sport forever. Uh, so that's what the that's what winning the classic is. And I I guess that's why uh, you know you experience what you experience seeing everybody put so much energy into it. Yeah, it was, it was a very unique experience to say the least. That, you know, you you stay in the house and you, everyone is at the boat ramp twenty minutes before daylight, or not twenty minutes, twenty minutes before we can even back in the boat on the water. Everyone's at the boat ramp, you know, amped to get on the water. You know, as soon as the latest you can be on the water, everyone's getting off the water at the same time, and it's, you could just see that there's a different passion for that tournament than the other tournaments of the year, and that was really cool to see. And it also showed me, like, if people work hard for this turn, just like this hard for this tournament, if I can do it for every single tournament year and treat every single tournament like I'm backing in for a Bassmaster Classic and put that effort in, you know, that was that's the extra percentage. You know, if I could, if I can compete and finish halfway of the field when they're giving their 100 percent, I'm giving them 100 percent. That maybe whenever they slip up a little bit and I give 110 percent, that could be the difference that I need to in the elites to maybe, you know, squeeze out even better finishes against these guys. So that's one thing I'm going to be looking forward to next year is, you know, being on the water as much as I can, working hard as I possibly can and seeing if I can hold my own against those guys out there. Uh, you know, I, I want to dive into that because, you know, you, you, cause you brought it up. You're going to be going into a, uh, a tournament trail that, um, that has a big off limits and a very short practice time. Uh, have you get? I'm I'm sure you've given that some thought. Like how how do you uh, how do you anticipate managing your your pre practice and that really two and a half days of official practice? 
that's a that's a very short practice time compared to the five days we had this year and previous years where it was no off limits for the opens. How, how do you how do you feel about that? How are you going to make your adjustment? Yeah, so I honestly, this is going to sound weird, but, like, I do so much pre-practicing. Like, I go to these places to become a local. I scan the whole lakes. And um, I feel like it's going to be somewhat of an advantage. Maybe not next year because I know we're going through a lot of the same places. These guys have a ton of experience on these lakes. And they don't really need the pre-practice. They don't need practice. They already know a lot of stuff that's going on that I won't know. But that's my that's going to be my job for the next couple months. I got to go to every one of these lakes, and I got to become a local. I mean, I got to squeeze in. I mean, let's say if these guys have been here five times, I got to squeeze five years of experience into just a few short months. And that's going to be the goal going into this year. And the shorter practice time, I don't really mind a shorter practice time that much because I have found it in some tournaments where I needed every bit of practice time. But I've also found a lot of tournaments recently that I, from my pre-practice, I already know where everything's at. I don't need to scan, and it's strictly just finding fish, and I usually end up finding my fish in the first couple of days of practice. And I'll, another thing is, what, I used to practice for a month before the tournament, and I noticed that a lot of my worst finishes were places that I knew the most about and practiced for the most amount of time because I ended up finding too much, and I ended up fishing for fish that were there a month ago and not the fish that are there now. So... The shorter practice time could definitely hurt me because, you know, they've been in this place a bunch of times and, you know, it's going to be hard for me to, you know, structure my practices properly with the time management and finding the correct amount of fish and with all that. And these guys have already been here, so they, number one, they're already way more adjusted to two and a half days. And another thing, they're already way more adjusted to these lakes. So next year is going to be definitely a learning experience with practice and pre-practice and trying to do my best to do the best I can in with those, you know, adjustments that i got to make next year yeah yeah that's well the you you talked about scanning um and it's amazing you're 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 going right now aren't you you're like you're done your family vacation we're practicing for the elites starting today i i I can sense that in you it's going to be starting very soon like i got to get some sponsor stuff done because you know this the season runs so late Mm -hmm. that you know we have to try to squeeze in as many sponsors and you know and, you know, obligations as we can just to make sure that we, you know, have enough money to participate in the sport the next year. And with it being so late, you got to get it done in the next two weeks. So I think I might take a week off to dedicate to getting all my sponsors in order, getting my next year's boat in order, my next year's motor in, in order, and all the sorts of stuff like that. And right. so I got to get that done, number one. To, but as soon as that's done, I mean, I'm going to go home for Christmas for maybe one day, and the rest of the time is going to be spent on the road. And just I don't, I'm not going to go home birthday, nothing. It's just going to be on the road dedicated 100%. And we just got to get past these for last few weeks of, you know, prepping for next year. And then after that, it's it's back on the road for fishing. Yes, that's that's commitment, boys. He's coming after you guys on the elites. Look out. Mm-hmm. This kid has got something. The uh, tell me, take me through a, a scanning like you're you're there months ahead. Um what what how do you how do you manage your time like you, you this a great phrase you said like I, I'm trying to become a local I gotta I gotta try to make up for all that experience I don't have yet uh, what what are you doing are you just are you driving spending all your time looking out at side imaging or are you are you fishing at all how how do you manage all that that prep time a lot of it depends lake to lake like a lot of it depends lake to lake so I. Another thing I love to do, I love to do a ton of research. Like, I do a lot of research. I mean, I'll dive so deep into BFL articles from years and years and years ago. If, or I'll watch every single TV show. I'll look at all the times of when they've been there. I'll make notes of how they caught them this month, how, how they caught them the next month. And I'll have each lake structured by month by month by month. And then I'll also know, like, what areas of the lake. So once I get all that dialed in and I get my schedule out, I'll figure out the months and I'll figure out everything that's going to going to do. And then I'll structure my scanning around that time of year. So like, let's say if we're going to Toledo Bend, they're going to be pulling up to spawn and also fork. We're going to be pulling up there. When they're pulling up to spawn. I think everybody knows Texas and drains is going to be a big deal. So I'm going to structure my, a lot of my practice around finding pre-spawn areas where these fish are wanting to set up and trying to do my best to find everything that I can. And then also, I might fish sometimes. You know, sometimes sometimes you can find a lot more fishing than you can scanning. 
just by how shallow it is and stuff. Or I might even drive the boat on plane and run all the trails to make sure I don't tear my motor off. <laughs> it depends. I mean, I, I practice for a lot of different things. I try to practice for as many different scenarios as I can, water level and time of year, full moon, what they're gonna be, where they're gonna pull to spawn. So that's kind of how I practice, but it's mostly scanning. Like I average 700, 700 hours of motor on a year. So that's kind of that's kind of how I yeah that's kind of how I structure my practices. It's mostly scanning, but you know you got to keep in mind a lot of other different factors as well. Seven hundred hours. That's like uh, man, you got to get that oil changed seven times in a year. <laughs> yeah, some yeah for sure. It's easily seven times. So like right now I'm already at five hundred, and I know I'm going to put two hundred on it by the end of the year. Like. That's a fact. And this year, I haven't scanned nearly as much as I have the other years because a lot of the lakes we went to this year, I already, I, I knew a little bit about, and I didn't need to scan. Like previous years, I I went to St. Lawrence River for a full month and scanned every single day, along with Champlain. But I didn't do that this year, so I I probably put a lot less hours in my motor this year than a few a couple of the years, which is still at 500. This you know, and we still got some time to go, so I'll easily reach the 600, 700 mark again. But that's kind of the hours that I look at about every year. All right, what's the what's the trick? That's a lot of scanning, a lot of looking at that screen. Is it Monster Energy, Red Bull? What do two in the back? <laughs> what? <laughs> how are you surviving all that screen time, man? That's a lot. Um, I've never drank an energy drink in my life, and I rarely even drink coffee. I think it's between the passion and just um, discipline. I love it. That's the only two things I can like. The only thing I've made made drink in the morning is sometimes the black rifle coffee you know I, I like those pretty good and you know just something quick to throw in the cooler just in case i do get tired or anything or i'll drink an orange juice i feel like orange juice wakes me up better than anything to be honest so that's about the two things i eat i drink in the morning that's that's it but the rest of it is just the passion for the sport and the passion for the learning experience of the sport and then just the discipline to know that this is how I've gotten here. This is what I kind of keep doing to keep improving. And if I want to be the best or best in the world, that this is the path that I have to take. How do you uh, maximize your, your graphing time? Like what do you have a system? Um, I'm not necessarily, I have a system. It's it. I do have a system in the sense of when I do a lot of research, like I'll spend one day and once I get dialed, because everyone knows that if you get dialed in on something, you're clued in, you're dialed. You, like if you're fishing points and you catch all your fish off points, you know what to look for on points. So what I'll do if I get really dialed in on a certain thing while I'm scanning, I'll say, all right, well, now let's go. Now that I'm dialed in, I know exactly what to look for. I'm going I'm to find every, every bit like this in the lake. Because everyone gets dialed into a something and it just clicks. It just starts, bam, bam, bam. You find stuff, find stuff, find stuff. It looks exactly like it. So I'm not, like, if I find a really good point pattern, I know what to look for, and I'm dialed in on points. I'm not going to go start scanning ditches. I'll, I'll work my way through it. I'll, I'll structure my practice in ways that, you know, I'll knock certain things out once I feel comfortable looking for that certain thing, and then I'll just structure it in other ways. I mean, I'll start at the boat ramp. I'll start in the most popular areas of the lake and scan everything, and or I'll. You know, I'll go to the sneaky areas of the lake that I don't think anyone's going to be around and, and try to work at a deal that I think could work that it might actually, you know, get me, you know, that's how you win is find something that no one else has done. So I'll, I'll sometimes structure it like that. It all just depends on how I'm feeling and what I found so far. All right. Information overload. I can see it coming. Like, oh, my gosh, I've got a thousand million waypoints on this lake. Uh, man, hat. How do you manage uh, information overload and, and so that you keep yourself dialed where you need to be? Yeah, so I, it, it's going to sound weird, but like whenever you go to a place, I could have a thousand, like on St. Louis River, I probably got a thousand something waypoints. Of all the hours that I've scanned, everything that mm -hmm. I've found, you know, I try to, every time I get on a pattern, you know, if you get on a rock vein that runs a certain way pattern, then all of a sudden you got 40 million waypoints of these certain rock veins that the fish are sitting on that day with that current, or you can get on a, a pattern where they're on the side of the point so you mark every side of the point then you end up with four point four waypoints on one hump so it i usually keep all those waypoints but the way i structure it is i found out a way to tune it out like if i'm on a certain pattern no waypoint matters except for that one and you know with lorance's waypoint management i can go in there and i could add stop signs and i could change the color coding to red green pink blue purple 
or anything, and I can kind of, you know, adjust my waypoints like that, name them. So that's kind of how I, I, I tune a lot of the stuff out is, you know, one naturally that I've, you know, I've had to do it so much. And then second of all is waypoint management organization. So that's kind of how I tune a lot of it out. Yeah, that's got to be crazy. Uh, you got to take good notes because if you have so many points and you, you you wind up the pattern changes on you and you're, you're fishing the sides of points that have stumps on it and you got to try to remember which one of those points that that are all clustered there has stumps you know that's 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 a lot of preparation time and that's that's hard to do yeah like i've i've been in tournaments many times where like i get done with the tournament i'm like holy cow i just, I, I forgot <laughs> one of my best points i i did not even fish my best stuff yes. because you know it, it was a sneakier spot that i didn't quite realize and mm-hmm. you know it just slipped my mind so i have that stuff happen to me all the time like Actually, where were we just at? Oh, I had a point in um, Lake of the Ozarks that I caught a four-pounder off in practice, and I know my cousin ended up catching a four-pounder in another tournament afterwards, and I never even fished in the tournament. Uh, I mean, it just slipped my mind completely. I completely yep. forgot about it, and I was right next to it. It happened to me at um, Harris Chain. I had a rock pile on Harris Chain that I just slipped my mind to fish on day two. And I look back at it, and I'm like, well, should have fished that. And I would have probably closed it out even sooner. But, you know, stuff like that happens. You just got to try to eliminate it where it doesn't happen all the time. You know, I, I've made mistakes. I think everybody makes mistakes. You just got to try to minimize those is the job that you have to do. Because you can't just eliminate all mistakes. None of us are perfect, and none of us are going to be perfect. You just got to try to be as perfect as you possibly can. That's true. And uh, I, I could see where you could miss, uh, you know, like or was just – talking about you know with so information overload it's a it's a it's a trick but um i'm looking at the elites this year um we're talking about that uh what bodies of water are you excited about like uh have you you, you, ones that you you can't wait to go to honestly the whole schedule looks awesome you know i have very little experience on toledo we had it open there but i it didn't click with me great, you know, there. So, you know, Toledo's one of them that I'm, I, you know, I don't know a lot about. Fork's another one. St. John's is another one. You know, I live near Murray, yeah. but I haven't had a lot of experience on Murray. Same thing with Smith. I've only been there as a co-angler. So those ones I'm I'm not exactly super excited for, as in, like, I think I can have a shot at top 10 or winning those ones. But I also, it. If how, it depends on how my pre-practice goes. You know, I can go there and I can feel like I'm going to win it. I find a little sneaky secret deal that not everybody else has found. and So that, you never know. But I am really looking forward to Harris Chain. Harris Chain didn't work out with there being no grass. They killed it all. The watercolor was terrible. For what I really wanted to go there and do, which I'm going to try to keep that not as open as I have been since it's in the schedule next year. Like, that's going to be a deal that I'm really looking forward to if that water clears up and I can kind of do what I want to do and also be grass. So we're going to see what happens at Harris Chain, if they can be a little bit of pre, little bit pre-spawn and not on the bed because I am probably the worst bed fisherman of all time. You know, when I look at the water, all I see is a big old glare. I tell everybody that's good at sight fishing, get on your knees and try to see the water. See in the water, it's <laughs> not going to happen. So, I mean, just being honest. So hopefully it's not going to turn out a deal like that. Yeah. But Harris Chain's one that I'm super excited for. Wheeler, I'm super excited for. I had a good event there this year, and I feel like I clicked with that place pretty good. And then St. Lawrence River and Champlain, I'm stoked to go to those places. Like, yeah. I've spent a lot of time. Now, Champlain's changed a lot in the last few years, but I think a lot of my deals still could play, and I also feel like I'm good at adjusting to what the new deal is. So we'll see. You know, it's all going to come down to pre-practice and hard work and, you know, try to – find more stuff because especially with it being a new deal like it is there right now that it might be one of those tournaments you can find something off the wall that not everybody else has figured out yet and not trying to beat up the areas that everybody else has found so we'll see yeah it's, that's that that is a great schedule and uh you know i appreciate your sight fishing situation i i've it's never been a, a real strength of, of mine but we we, we had to you got to go check out uh, drew cook's um uh, sight fishing seminar of Bash U. It's one of the most eye-opening um, 
you know, seminars about that technique that, that I've ever heard delivered. And we have a lot of them on Bash University, but, but they're, those guys, Drew Cook and Drew Benton, are really ahead of the curve on that. And, and I'm 5'10". I always, I'm always jealous of the six-footers uh, like the guys next to me. They, they just they can see better. They got a better angle. It's unfair. They should eliminate sight fishing from tournaments. It's my opinion. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think it was Chris Bose that I was talking to. I was like, can we please come up with a rule where, like, you know, we just measure the height of the tallest person in the field, and then everyone else is below that can build a platform up to that height. I feel like that's fair. That's, like, <laughs> the closest seriously. thing to fair as you can get. So I feel like that's yes. a great, like, I think that's a great <laughs> idea. Like, I mean, I get a foot-and-a-half pedestal, and, you know, Jeff Gustin, you know, he gets to stay on the floor. You know, I feel like that's fair. His boat's already nine foot out the water. He should be able to see everything. So, <laughs> uh, so I like, I love that idea. I'll, yeah. I'm in. I'll sign that petition, JT. You, you're I'll sign it so the, fast. You're allowed <laughs> to stand on the trolling motor, right? Yeah, but everybody has a trolling motor. Like, yeah. even if I'm on the trolling motor, I'm the same height as Gussie. I mean, it's hang, not ha- hang on, hang on. I, I got you, man. Have you seen those saltwater Minn Kotas that are like, they're like the shaft is like four feet above the boat. Yeah, I pull up to the Minkota trailer to get my 97 inch troll yeah. to put on that. <laughs> hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. Hey, you know they they had platforms. Roland Martin, there's a, there's a Roland Martin rule against platforms. I didn't know if you. Oh, if, I, I've yeah, I've definitely heard of you know people in the past you know standing on motor cowlings and all yep. sorts of stuff. Like there's a lot of ways that people try to get around it, and I, I just think it'd be easy. So you get to build your platform. Why not? Everyone, everyone can be the same height. Like we go to the boats, measure the boats how far off the water, measure the decks, measure the people, and then that's we build a level playing field. I feel like that's totally fair. Yeah, I I I like it too. But I also have another rule. I have uh, 56 year old eyes. So you have to wear a fuzzy yeah. lens that matches my 50-year-old eyes. If we're going to build platforms, we need to do that, too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a slippery slope for sure. You could probably go on for days on how many different things you could possibly do. That's so I understand Chris Bose's stance on it. <laughs> That's funny. I could, I'll go around with sandpaper just rubbing up everybody's lenses. Yeah. So they can't see. They can't see good. But uh, well, that's a, it's it's an exciting uh, tournament trail that you're 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 going on. Now we jump to uh, we jump to that because one of my questions here is, are you going to take the invitation? I, I don't think this is even a a question or a concern, man. We're going to the elites. We're going all in. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I'm going for sure. Like. There's no doubt about it. It's been my dream for years. This is what I've been working, you know, since I was four years old. Well, not since I was four years old, but since I was 16 years old, this is what I've been dedicating my life to. And I've definitely taken the invitation, and it's probably the most stoked I've ever been about anything that's ever happened in my life. So, for sure, taking that invitation, 100%. Awesome. Well, how, how, you talked about sponsorship. How, how, how has that been? Is that a rocky road for you? Is it uh, – are you, are you seeing some headway? Are you getting some of your companies that are excited about it? Where, where are you at with your sponsorship hunt right now for next year? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a work in progress. You know, we have such a late time in the year, and I'm trying to schedule as many things as I can as fast as I can and try to keep them all in order. And um, it's definitely something that's very new to me. I've never really, you know, worked for sponsors work towards sponsors and you know but i know i got to work towards them now and it's mainly been dedicated to fishing so it's all a learning experience for me i'm very new to it but it's all it's all you know angler deer definitely helped and uh it's definitely gonna help in the future as well so i'm working towards it but it's definitely it's definitely a learning experience that i'm definitely having to learn very quickly on how to structure how to organize it how to understand you know which which sponsors go with which and you know how to you know, structure the best, how to speak to people in a lot more educated sense. So it's definitely just a big learning experience that I'm trying to take in strides and try to learn as fast as I can to make sure I don't mess anything up. So that's kind of where we're at now. It's just, it's just a big learning experience and I'm working on it. So. Sure. It's, it is a big learning experience and it's a big expense. Have you, uh, have you looked at the budget? Have you, uh, have you figured out, all right, it's going to cost me X amount of dollars next year. I mean, I, I know roughly what it took to fish the opens, and I know you're going to add entry fees to that. So I'm assuming it's not going to be a ton different. You just add a 
you just add the entry fees into it. So, yeah, I understand the budget, and I definitely got to work towards, you know, filling that budget to make sure that it's not a complete loss for me in the future years. So that's one thing I got to I gotta work towards and definitely got to learn a little bit better and understand better. Just because fishing is not just fishing anymore. You got to be you got to be a business person, a fisherman. You got to be a social media person. You got to be it's three jobs in one, really, if you want to be truly good at it. And that's one thing I, I got to learn the other two sides. I've, I've dedicated my last three years to fishing, and now, you know, I got to find a way to still give 100% to fishing, but find 10% to give to social media and then 10% to give to, yeah. you know, sponsors and stuff like that. And hope and just, I got to make sure that 10% is enough to make sure that my sponsors feel, you know, completely accommodated for what they're producing for me because I'm going to be starting a YouTube channel. We're starting a lot of different stuff here in the very short future with a full-time cameraman i'm hoping you know travel with me around the country i still haven't found one yet but i am on the search for a full-time cameraman to travel around with me you know i want to do like a daily vlog type of deal there's not anything like that in the fishing industry yet now and i want to start a daily vlog of like the the life of a fisherman not like you know everybody loves watching tournament videos but i think if we start something to actually show the life of a fisherman you know every single day we get on the water every you know week day after day after day and show like the insides and outs of fishing i think that's something that i'm really w working towards and so there's a lot of different things that i'm working towards that i'm having to learn about right now so super excited to see the learning process unfold and try to do the best i can at you know taking advantage of all of them just keep catching them i love I absolutely the ultimate you know that that takes care of everything i like the way wrong. you did it too jt i and i want to compliment you there because a lot of guys um don't get the get the cart in front of the horse in my opinion you know they worry about the social media they worry about trying to get sponsorships and and they don't have their fishing business squared away and and making that your priority and i think that's a great example for anybody uh trying to follow in your footsteps is fishing first yeah um and you know because if you if you catch yeah. them the, the rest yeah, everything else falls in a line yeah the rest so can far, follow as, for, as far as the sponsor money your entry fees like I, mm -hmm. I was just looking at your stats a little bit jt it, it looks like you just on the opens you, you won about 70 grand this year is, is that it, I, i'm close right i'm in the ballpark yeah I, I think if you had the if you take away the classic and then like if, i think total earnings. oh yeah with, I, I had the classic in there yeah, yeah for sure yeah, I think after AOY and everything, I think it was like 89 or something like that. So, so yeah, so like I said, year. again, that, <laughs> you, your your entry fees, just pull it out of that. You, you, you know, you mean? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. <laughs> it, it takes care of itself when you catch them. Well, that's, uh, that's awesome. Now, I want to – there's some drama going on. Uh, I say drama. Well, we're going to make it dramatic right now the, with the some potential – rules changes or limitations um as we we hear rumors about what's going on with the elites and the uh a committee that i think has been formed and i'm just i'm just i don't have any facts on this stuff but i it's just what i hear from talking with guys in the industry and um about forward-facing sonar what some potential limitations on that could be next year to year after that how important was that to you how important is it to your fishing and uh um what's your take on some potential limitations there yeah i mean i think you know i don't think limitations is gonna stop anything that i'm doing you know there is still hard work it's it's still you know bare bones bass fishing you know, it's a lot of intelligence, but it's a lot of hard work and who it, it's who puts in the most amount of time and who does a lot of things. So I don't think that, you know, whether it be eight pan ops or one pan ops or no pan optics, I don't think there's there's no stopping, you know, hard work and dedication when it comes to any sport there is. So I think that a lot of the younger kids, you know, they have more time to dedicate to the sport and hard work. And I think that's what's really doing it. I don't think it's necessarily pan optics i do think it definitely helps you know newer age technology is going to help the newer age you know the people who are more willing to adapt and adjust and learn and you know it's hard to whenever you call them one way the, your whole entire life it's hard to change that so I, I get every single side of every single you know aspect of the sport and where people are coming from from both sides but i don't think it's going to change the newer age taking over i mean it's honestly weird that bass fishing is an older age sport 
look at every other sport in bass fishing or every every other sport other than bass fishing. You don't see 50-year-olds out there, you know, like usually dominating sports. So seeing a younger age isn't really a shock to me. But I also do see the side where, you know, experience is also a lot bigger, you know, avenue of bass fishing than it is. Like if even if you look at chess, like chess has nothing to do with, you know, technology or new age. But you still see younger people taking over that sport. You know, it's just a it's just a hard fact of life that, you know, the people who are more willing to dedicate the time and have the ability to dedicate the time and also have the they're young, younger minds that learn a little, little, learn a little faster. They're not, you know, as clogged up as, you know, older people who have a lot of other things going on. You know, we don't have as many things to worry about. So I think there's a lot of different ways you can look at it. And, um, I, I completely understand where everybody's coming from from every side. So that's just kind of the, my take on it. I don't think it's going to stop it, but pan office definitely has helped me for sure. I'm not going to act like it hasn't, you know, I feel like I've taken advantage of it you know, as best I could, you know, I learn it. I've dedicated a lot of time to it and I hate to see it leave because of how much, you know, time I know a lot of anglers, they've spent entire winters learning how to do it. So I don't, I'd hate to see it leave. And, you know, I think it's, it's something I think we need to learn to embrace and learn how to cover a little bit better to really get the most out of it. I think is another big side of it too. So it's good to be talking to somebody that's pro forward facing sonar, uh, which, you know, it seems like, uh, you know, we've been talking with a lot of a lot of negative there, but I, I love it. It's not only, you know, it, it has enlightened me and many everybody about what fish do and the way they move. And, and it's exposed patterns that we, we just could never, ever figure out before. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I think it's fascinating. And I, I, I do too. look forward to it continuing. Yeah, absolutely. And I also don't agree with the whole entire aspect of, I think it's hurting the fish. I don't think it's hurting the fish at all. Like Champlain, like I know a lot of people are saying, oh, now the fish don't have any place to hide. Well, now we're fishing for a completely different fish we've never caught before. You know, we're not going to the same rocks, catching the same fish. I mean, it's very common knowledge that, you know, the same fish spawn on the same beds and same fish live on the same rocks every year. So it's not like these anglers are going out there and catching the same bass every single year and snatching them from his home. Now we're, we're opening up the avenue to instead of being able to catch, you know, 40% of the bass in the lake, we can catch 100% of the bass in the lake. And we're actually spreading out the pressure that's put on these fish. So, yeah, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that I think a lot of people have just taken a very narrow sight to and haven't really looked at it in a different way. Yeah, I think it's, you know, just on like Toledo and Sam Rayburn and all these places with standing timber. I think all this fish haven't been touched for years. And now, you know, we're getting relief from the bank. Like those bank fish that have been beat up for so many years, now they're getting some relief. And, you know, the, the timber are getting a little bit extra pressure, but it's not going to hurt anything that they get any pressure because it's going to it's gonna overall make, make fishing better. You can go to the timber and catch fish. You can go to the bank and catch fish, and it's going to make both of them slightly better. So I, I think it's great for the sport. I think it opens up a lot of new avenues. I think it opens up a lot of new, new ways of thinking. It, it keeps us from getting stuck in the mud from every single lake. You know, I mean, how who wants to watch – I mean, I, I get it. A lot of people don't understand it right now, but I think it's going to take just a learning curve. But no one wants to watch someone go to the same lake, catch them on the same point, catch them on the same rock every single time we go, like they, you know, sometimes do at St. Lawrence River and Champlain. So I think seeing new ways to catch fish, I think it's exciting, but I can also see where it's not exciting. So I'm going to, you know, I'm working hard to make it as understanding as possible on both sides and, you know, try to be as accommodating to both sides as possible because I, you know, you have to learn to, uh, you know, agree and understand both sides to make sure that you are, you know, liked by both sides as well. Because, you know, everyone has opinions and no one's wrong and no one's ever right. And you have to try to be as perfectly understanding of both sides as possible. So, I, I like that. I like that. Uh, I like that perspective. And I think it's uh, I think it's a good one. And, and you know, it's watchability has been in, in uh, contested. Um, I love the screen on screen stuff. I love when guys are talking about what they're seeing on that screen. I think that's great. But, you know, I, if we, if you've ever watched a sight fishing tournament, it's the same thing. You're looking at the back of a guy. Mm -hmm. If you've ever watched a ledge fishing tournament for the last 20 years, you're staring at the back of a guy. It's just, that's any offshore patterns are going to have that same appearance as a forward facing sonar uh, tournament will have. So I don't I don't buy that argument. And 
actually, yeah, when we were we were down at uh, the ASA uh, event just recently, and I, I spoke with some people from Bass, and they said the ratings on the forward facing sonar tournaments were actually up from previous years. So, oh. so it's why so it's watchability being contested. Is seems like it's not it's not the deal. It's not the real the real deal. Yeah, so I, I agree 100%. I mean, before on Champlain, we, I mean, we watched an absolute masterclass of Brandon Polinick with 360. I mean, right. he was making everybody look silly with 360. He was still staring at a screen, but he was so good at what he does, and he was such a, like, you know, connoisseur of the, the electronic side of it. He just did it with a different screen. Like, it, it just because it's not live doesn't mean it doesn't do the same thing. And he was just yeah. so good at it that, you know, he dominated I mean, I remember he dominated Champlain. He dominated St. Lawrence River with all this technology. And we watched Gussie dominate with, you know, sonar. But then everybody doesn't like whenever he dominates with live sonar. So I, it, it, a lot of it's just confusing. And I think a lot of it's just, you know, I think a lot of it's coverage. I, I don't think the coverage of it is very well, very good either. You know, I think a lot of people do think that you see a dot, you cast to it, it bites you up the hook, you put it in the box, and you can roll on. It's... But it's not, it's not like that even remotely close. And I, I think if we could ever get to the point where we can get the, the live sonar on the screen and, and be able to have people talk through it and understand that side of the sport a lot better, I think we'd be a lot better off as a community to learn about it. And plus, it's hard to relate with something you don't have. And I think if it's possible in the future to make Panoptics more of an available you know, electronic to a lot of people, you know, work on making it affordable with – I think as competition grows in the electronic side, exactly with the electronic side of the fishing industry, I think everybody's coming out with theirs, and competition's great, and it drops prices. So I think as more people get pan optics, the more people will understand it and understand that it's not just cast to a dot and catch a fish. And that's whenever we're going to see the sport take a big leap because I just don't want to see the sport this close to being the next big thing with technology and and, and awakening you know a, a new group of people. But we just turn around and go right back to, you know, the old ways. And, you know, I think the old ways is limited to how far it can go. But if we really, you know, open up this new side of the sport and, you know, really dedicate some time to figuring out how to cover it the best, I think right. there's a lot more room for growth than there is for, you know, loss of, you know, viewership. I think there's a lot more room to grow done properly than there is to lose viewers. So I just think it needs to be attacked properly. That's all I think. Yeah, I mean – it gets compared to video game fishing a lot now. Well, guess what? There is a very lot popular. of freaking kids that <laughs> yeah. are paying to watch video people games play the video popular games. Thing in the world. <clears throat> so. There's million dollar tournaments that like anglers are, or not anglers, but they're, they're, video games are the most popular thing in the world, period, bar none. There's nothing more popular than video games. Go look at the stats. The tournaments cost more. The tournaments are bigger. Their tournaments are the viewerships are off the charts. The amount of people making money on YouTube are playing video games. So people calling it video game fishing, it I don't even think it's hardly an insult. Like mm -hmm. yep. video games, the biggest thing in the world and fishing's just got a piece of that. So why can't we just introduce, you know, more people from the video game side and it can grow the sport. It's just another avenue to grow in my opinion. So I think there's definitely a lot more to it than people realize. And I just think we need to show it better. Engagement. I, well, the, one of the things that I see with like my son who's 14, uh, you know, watching, watching the live sonar is, is engaging immediately. Like previously it would be, you know, where I'm casting in my mind, I, I have a visual like all fishermen do about what's going on with my bait, what's going on under the water, <coughs> uh, you know, what the predators could be doing. And now he can be in that world with me by by uh -huh. engaging immediately with the screen where you know previously they're lost right they they have this they have to have this amazing patience to try to wait for something to happen that they can't see or understand now immediately they're engaged we see it with crappie fishermen too that you know crappie yeah. the, the sport of crappie is like going nuts because people that couldn't you know they just stare at a cork and hope they had it in the right spot before but now they're they're on the hunt and they're engaged through this whole process and we're you know we're seeing the sport of fishing you know i think uh it takes that engagement part where people go out they have a fun experience and they're likely to come back and do it again uh and i think i think that technology definitely 
brings that to the table. I agree. I, I think it also brings a lot of older people back into the sport. You know, yep. I, I've, I've heard the argument where a lot of older people, they don't have the time, they don't have the energy to go out there and dedicate eight hours to figure out how to catch the crappy out of brush piles and, you know, spend all that time learning where they're at and everything to where now they can just drop a pan out because in a pocket, scan around, go to the brush, pull over to it, line up, and, and you know, it makes it more efficient for these people who are weekend anglers. They don't have the entire week to go figure them out. And now they have just the weekend to go do it and pan out just makes you just that much more efficient. So I think there's a lot more room for growth than people are realizing. And I think it could be the next big thing. Well, the, the, the price point uh, really, you know, we need to see that come down and make some units that are more affordable for, you know, most people. And I think that'll just naturally happen as it does, yeah. you know, with technology and as they figure out how to make things better and, and smaller and, and everything that, 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 that they do with technology, but uh really good, refreshing perspective. We haven't had too many people come on and, and be pro uh, for this technology. So I appreciate that. And, uh, and, and I like to hear it and all, all the, the points are valid. One of the other points that, uh, that I hear made and I, and it's baits like, Oh, the baits are going to go away. Selections are going to go away. It's, you know, I feel the opposite. Like my experience is growing. I'm, buy, I'm buying all different kinds of baits now because I'm trying to figure out new and innovative way to, to trigger these blobs that I'm seeing. Yeah, I I think that's quite the opposite. I think it's just open up a whole other avenue of sports. I mean, you're not gonna you're not, you're not gonna stop catching fish one way because there's a new way. I mean, that's not how it's gonna happen. I mean, I heard I heard of something crazy like oh, they're going to get rid of jigs. It's going to become a different thing, like, you know, just regular Arky head jigs. And then I look at Tyler Williams, who's, you know, dominated the last three tournaments on an Arky head jig with live scope. So yep. it's just, it, I, I, none of it really makes a lot of sense. If you stand back and look at it, it makes sense initially whenever you're like, oh, yeah. And then you go look at it, you're like, well, not really. So, like, even you got anglers like Tyler Williams, you know, dominating with an Archie head jig and you say people are, oh, you can't catch them on a jig anymore because you're going to get beat offshore with a um, Demiki head. Not really. You just go throw a jig at the same dots and if you learn how to do it better, it, it works. So, right. there's there's a lot of different, I, I really think it's growing the sport. I think it's opening up new things like, especially Japan. I mean, a lot of those guys are able to come over here and learn a lot faster because of it and we're, it, we're able to see a lot more new new faces and it's really refreshing seeing this come to the sport and all these new things that are coming from it so i think it's super refreshing seeing a, a new age of sport personally i i i agree with you tyler williams you guys are buddies are you gonna room together next year would he are you are you is he gonna accept the invitation too do you know yes he he's 100 percent accepting an invitation and um, me and him have worked together for the last few tournaments and it's i mean we went i think we went sixth and seventh to first and second to basically at all three turns we've been we've been right next to each other all in the top 10 or Ooh. top 15 i mean it, it's been a really good run for us and i'm i'm excited to see you know if he wants to i mean if he wants to carry it through the next year i'm super excited to see what he can do because i really think that me and him could you know really we, we figured out something pretty special and um i think both of us have a pretty good grip of it grip of it and I know he's a little, he's a lot better than I am when it comes to, you know, up north angling for largemouth and different ways to catch largemouth. And then I feel like I have a really big help for him when it comes to shallow water river fishing, shallow water reservoirs, you know, grass fishing. So I think me and him, we fish a little bit different, but we also fish a lot the same. We just do it a slightly different. So I, th I think me and him could do, do could do some really big things in the elites if we work together. So I'm super excited to see what comes up. Uh, that will be exciting. We'll look forward to watching that. Uh, Justin, you got an IM? Yeah, we had a couple questions about like some of the baits you relied on heavily this year, JT. Uh, I mean, I know a couple of them just from seeing some Bassmaster articles, but what were some of your confidence baits this year that helped you along Great the way? Great question. Yeah, so like I said, number one bait for me this year was probably an Archie head jig, period, point blank. Wow. I mean, I, I threw an outcast tackle juice jig so much this year that it's, it's, I don't think it's left my deck. I mean, I have so huh. many, you know, 
I don't. I think it's been on my deck every single tournament this year. Outcast Tag will make some of the best jigs in the market, and you know we're hopefully gonna have some new stuff coming very soon. We'll see. And I'm um, super excited to be hopefully be paired with that company next year, and super excited to see what comes of it. But yeah, jig is gonna be a big deal for me, whether it be football, archy head, swim jig, you know, jig head, minnow. You know, they carry all of it, so everything they have is very high quality and works very well. So that's definitely one of my number one baits. And then number two is a jerk bait. I mean, I love throwing a jerk bait around. I mean, I have a bunch of different jerk baits that I throw, but a jerk bait is definitely one of those baits that I can use on pan optics and trigger fish that a lot of people, a lot of other people can't trigger with cadence and sinking it down. You know, making it float, making it do a lot of different stuff. And then probably the last one is a wacky rig. You know, just a regular old five-inch Senko weightless. I mean, it's hard to beat it. I mm. can throw it at suspended fish. I can throw it up underneath docks. You know, you follow Oklahoma, I put a lot of fish in the boat with it. I mean, I put a lot of fish in the boat with it a lot this year. And then another bait that I've actually picked up a lot is a glide bait. I mean, I throw a glide bait a lot. So it's just something that, you know, once I – it's only – I might make 10 casts with it all day, but sometimes those 10 casts are very important. You know, they put one big one in the boat. Like a Watts bar, right? I mean, I had a really solid shot of win that tournament all on a glide bait the last days. And, you know, a jig as well. You know, that jig came into play there too, but it was a glide bait a lot of it. So I ended up breaking off. I broke off the winning fish, you know, very once in the day, and I lost another one that probably could have won me the event. So oh, no. The glide, the, glide bait, the glide bait is definitely another big player, but those are probably my four number one baits overall. Jerk bait, jig, wacky rig, and a glide bait. What do you like throwing on the back of the jig? You go with uh, Rage Menace a lot, or? Um, it depends on the jig. I mean, Rage Menace, Rage Crawl, Rage, you know, Rage Structure Bug. Usually, it's mostly those. And then, if I want something not flapping, I'll just put like a Beaver style, like a striking Beaver style bait on the back of it. So, Got I mean, it. it depends a lot of times. You know, depending on the how fast I want it to fall. If I want to skip it, if I want to cast it, if I want it to have big flaps, no flaps, it just definitely have a lot of different things i can do with it well that's uh it's been a great year it breaks my heart you broke off the winning fish and you lost probably a very high dollar glide bait all in the same moment <laughs> yeah that was that was not fun i remember i remember watching the fish like he swallowed the whole glide bait and he went to a tree and i i, I swung and when i did he turned and i i put more pressure and when I did, I was throwing 20 pound line. I should have been throwing 25, and I, it just broke. Oof. And I think I probably had a nick in my line of, of doing a glide bait and bumping a rock. Or it's definitely something on my end that I did wrong that I got to look back at myself. So, but that's how it goes. And my buddy Tyler won it, so I couldn't be. Ha I, you know, I there's nowhere else, no one else in the field that I'd rather see win it than Tyler. And that was awesome to see him win it. And that was a super awesome experience that I won't forget. And that was just a cool tournament in general. I mean, I think. Tyler was 21, I was 21, and Trey was 18, and it was first, second, third. So I think it's probably the <laughs> youngest top three of all time. So that yeah. was just a really cool tournament overall to see. Well, I really love everything that you said about all your opinions on Ford facing sonar, except for the old guys have to go part of your comments. Uh, other than that, I'm <laughs> right there with you. <laughs> uh jt it's great man thanks for coming on the show and and uh i'm glad you survived the traffic over there i, I really want to let you go so you can get the heck out of there i'm worried about all those tractor trailers going by but uh i wish you best oh, of luck good. best of luck on the elites and uh you know keep we'll be watching and obviously and uh keep us posted on how things are going and thanks again man i really appreciate you being with us today Hey, I, I appreciate it too, man. I love coming on the podcast with y'all guys, and I hope I could be on here soon again after, you know, hopefully a good year on the elites. We'll see. Well, we'll be talking to you. We'll be talking to you, buddy. And uh, like I said, good luck. Thanks again, JT Tompkins, everybody. Elite, Elite Series Pro. Here we go. Here we go, brother. Good luck JT. to you. Good luck to you. We'll catch up with you. Have a great day. Awesome. Thank you. All. Have a good day. Bye. You bet. Man, what a deal. They're all getting after. Can you imagine? I mean, that's got to be so exciting. 21 years old, going mm -hmm. after the elites, uh, just on the, at the top of your game. I know. I mean, he, he, he's he got such an early start, you know, yeah. and you, you, you see that so often that, you know, the time on the water. I mean, the time on the water, everybody knows that's the, mm. that's the king. It will always be the king. Um, but, I mean, gosh, he just – he's got the drive. He's got the commitment. And uh, 
it's exciting to see where he's going to go with it. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's shown that he can win, which is the hardest thing to do sure. is to win. Yep. Um, and now he's won a, a pretty very difficult AOI uh, event. So absolutely, uh, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see how he does in the elites. But I, from what I've seen, you know, competing head to head with this with this kid for uh you know a couple years now out on the out on the opens i think he's got the chops uh i think a lot of those kids that may are going to be in the elites this year have the chops for it so uh we are uh we got a lot going on we got we have a like and share if you're watching us over on social don't forget about that like and share the feed we're going to be giving away a prize on that real quick and we're going to be asking a, a grand prize question here shortly we're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back and we're going to be giving away some stuff leader in underwater viewing technology. Find what you are looking for. Catch more fish. Have more fun. AquaView. Seeing is believing. Why do you love catching fish and rods? I'm truly losing less fish. It is the sensitivity of the rod. That are made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick, every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worman series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I've found that can withstand my hook set. Boom goes the dynamite. On the water, not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Portland Line Master Braid, America's premium super braided fishing line. Manufactured in our Cortland, New York facility and constructed from the highest quality spectra fibers available. Cortland Line Company, made in America since 1915. I have to have the best eyewear. My eyes are essential to doing my job. It's the highest quality lens that I've ever used. Top of the line performance in these glasses. But they're priced for absolutely everyone. The everyday angler can afford them. As a touring professional pro, if I can depend on them, I know the weekend angler can as well. Hobie eyewear, built for the pros. Price for everyone. Uh, yeah, we're just reliving, uh, that interview. What a, what a, what a cool deal. Uh, so young, so successful. It's awesome to see. Uh, speaking of which Jake and I, uh, battled you this weekend, uh, at the Chester County Bassmasters on the upper Chesapeake Bay. Uh, me and Jake jumped, jumped in a derby and, uh, that's right. You yeah. guys got the lunker smallmouth. Yeah. Uh, Jake caught the lunker smallmouth. Yeah. He caught it on a new technique that he learned. Uh, just recently, um, and it's a, f a finesse swim bait that that he's using. Ten pound Cortland high vis braid 
with a fluorocarbon leader and just crawling that thing. I don't know how he does it. It's like an eighth ounce weight and you're fishing in 10 feet of water, but just crawling it. He caught the, he caught the lunker smallmouth of the tournament on that bait. And, uh, that was spent the money immediately. <laughs> spent the money immediately like as soon he we got a uh we got a gift certificate for uh um not bass pro shops what's the other cabela's. one cabela's, cabela's. same thing nowadays. yeah yeah same thing so on the way home like he's like dad we got to stop so we're shopping <laughs> we're, we're we're shopping i'm like so tired it rained all day freezing cold we had to go we had to burn that 50 dollars up and uh, and we did that immediately that's awesome what did he and, buy he bought a lipless, some lipless bait. Nice. He bought a glide bait. No kidding. A yep. glider, huh? Yeah. He's fascinated with them. Although we haven't, you know, have been around where we caught a lot with them yet. Right. But right. He, he, I think he likes to collect. Them. Right. Okay. You know, right. so we, he got some of that stuff. He got some jig trailers. Nice. And uh, he bought himself a net because he wants to, uh, we used a, you know, we don't usually use a net, but in the team tournament, we were yeah. using a net. Yeah. And he liked that. He he bought himself a net that he can carry with him to uh, to the ponds when he fishes Make by sure himself. Make sure he lands those giants. Make sure he lands the giants. So that's we, awesome. We had a ball doing that. And uh, man, there's a, Bash University. You've been uh, filming uh, some great instructional yeah. training courses with some guys uh, recently. But as always, we've had some, uh, you know, some terrific releases this past week on Bash U. Yeah, for sure. We uh, th th this coming week we have uh, Jay Shkurt, uh is going to be our classroom release, and Lee Livesey is our on water release. Uh, Jay Shakurt's classroom session is pro to co or co to pro, mm. whichever way you want to you want to go. Um, so Jay Shkurt, uh obviously we all know him on the Elite Series now. He's very accomplished. He's got a blue trophy. He's got a Rookie of the Year. He's going to be back in the class again. He's really succeeding at the highest level and his progression as an angler went from the back of the boat to the front of the boat. He spent a year uh, as a co-angler on the, on the opens and spent that year learning and he had a really good year. I think he won co-angler of the year uh, out on the opens and in this seminar, he doesn't necessarily teach about how to be a co-angler or how to be a boater. It's, focused on the lessons learned from the back of the boat and how they translate to both, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's things that co-anglers may do differently than boaters. And there's things that boaters may do differently than co-anglers, but more times than not, those techniques, they translate to both worlds, whether you're on the front or you're on the back. Um, so it's a really good seminar. Um, it, it, it goes in depth on some of the techniques and his learning process to get from the back of the boat to the front of the boat. And then ultimately, be successful right out of the gate um, as a boater on the Bassmaster Elite Series. So winning, an elite, winning a blue trophy, winning Rookie of the Year, um, that's a really good seminar. And then the next one that we're releasing on Thursday is shallow water smallmouth fishing with Lee Livesey. Um, and, what a great time to go shallow water oh, smallmouth man, fishing so, right so, now. So much fun. And, mm. uh, you know, the – we saw a lot out on the professional circuits this year, guys, smallmouth fishing and using their electronics, using their forward facing sonar. We talked a lot about that on this show, but while that is going on, there's almost always a group of shallow water fish available to mm -hmm. be caught. Um, and you know, it's back to, it's back to the basics. It's, it's pick up your pick up your bladed jig and roll. Pick up your spinner bait and roll. Pick up your swim bait and just go. And my favorite way to fish, by the way. Yes, very very fun. And one of the cool things that we that we we did in this seminar is we shot it at a few. We we filmed a few different times during the day. And because one of the things that we learned was there's there's windows where these shallow water smallmouth are up. They're available and they're biting. And a lot of it is dictated on the weather and the conditions that you're dealing with. And if you get those conditions, there's not a better place to be than up shallow, you know, running sandbars, fishing around boulders and catching these big, giant, shallow water smallmouth. So that's a really good one there, too. 
Um, you know, Lee has a really, really defined approach to his fishing. He doesn't overcomplicate things. He has his own system on how he does it. He sticks to it and it works. So definitely check that out. That's going to be a good one as well. And stay tuned, um, for what we got coming up down the road. We're always filming. We're always shooting content. And, uh, guys, if you, if there's stuff you want to learn about and you want to see us film, or you want us, you, you, you want us to, to dive in on, let us know, man. Shoot us a message on the socials, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. Send us an email, whatever. We want to hear from you. We want to keep delivering the content that we do because ultimately it's all about helping you guys learn. So um, we're going to keep grinding, keep working at it, and hopefully keep delivering the juice. And get yourself a ticket. Go to thebassuniversity.com. Our ticket window is open. Go get yourself some tickets. Uh, I forgot to mention that Jake has a signature uh, color red and he wears the hank cherry hobies that's right when he competes oh yeah that's awesome he has a signature can you believe he has a signature? he's 14 he has, yeah. a, he has a he has a color oh he's dialed dude yeah he, i mean when i saw him at the tournament he was he was <laughs> he was vibing man he had yeah. the bash university jersey on he did the hat, the hat trimmed down just right the the, the hank cherry hobie this Hobie is, i wear sunglasses this is his lucky hat this yeah. this hat doesn't exist anymore we had a limited run of these and he's he nabbed one and every lunker he's caught every tournament yeah. he's done well at he's, he's wearing this hat so he does not go fishing without that that's hat. awesome but uh but shout out to hobie for for building jake's classes and uh <laughs> and uh, and want to give a shout out to epoch batteries guys they're amazing mm-hmm. batteries i mean uh, one of the cool things is I, I couldn't charge where I was at, and uh, we practiced for a little bit the night before the tournament. Didn't even have to worry about didn't, it. Don't have to worry about it. That trolling motor will run for days uh, with that 36-volt Epoch. It's uh, it's just amazing. Go check them out. You got a great discount as a member of Bass University. And uh, we have some cool stuff. Let's give away some stuff, guys. We have a Facebook like and share. Go do it right now. Because right now we're going to ask the grand prize question, and then we're going to give away the like and share winner. What do you got, Justin? All right. So grand prize uh, question this week. What body of water did JT top 10 in in his first Toyota Series event? When he was like 10 years old? I think yeah. he was 16, something like yeah. that. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. It's 16. My goodness. Yeah. I think I, I didn't even join my first bass club until I was in – like my 20s i didn't i didn't know about this sport back then i wish i'd have known st crest got it already you got top 10 at age 16 on the potomac river yes he sure did good word st crest that was that was a softball question i think Uh, a couple people a couple people got it wrong so did they yeah Yeah. so i mean crest is dialed i I mean mean, he's on you know he's on the program he knows what's going on speaking of uh guys on the program we got a subscriber shout out this week zachary queenie Yep. Um, Shout got out. A, got a picture. Oh, yep. boom! There he is, Yo nice. Zach. That's a that's a Jersey guy right there. He was the co angler winner at the Bassmaster Regional this year uh, on the Potomac River. Well done. Uh, yeah, he he won the co angler side of things. Zach, he's a yeah, he's a he's a South Jersey guy. Always rocking the bass you hat. Keep it up, Zach. We see you working. We see you working, big dog. Good job. Good job, guys. Send us your picks, man. Well, we'd love to showcase you guys on uh, on our live show. And I see, I see. A hand. I'm not ready to close the show yet. Jocelyn, <laughs> no. she's got her hand going. What What do you got going our, on? Our like and share winner is Ricky Brewer. Hey, Ricky! Thanks for Shout watching. Thanks for liking and sharing the feed. Appreciate you, and uh, appreciate all you guys watching. I'm looking around now because I always I always forget stuff. You know? I I also uh, wanted to t- give a a big shout out to Cash and Rods because. At the uh, Pittman Creek Wholesale oh, yeah. Show, they won Best New Rod. Got some Ooh. hardware for that spinnerbait yeah. rod. Seven, wow. Seven foot two, uh, medium heavy mod fast, I think. Nice. Yeah. Uh, that'll be that's a good little fast spinnerbait action. and chatterbait rod. Yeah, it's a good good length right there on the rod. Well, well done, Cash, and we love our Cash and Rods, and uh, congratulations on a, on a great, great win, great product. Guys, uh, thanks so much for watching. We're going to be back next week with another edition of Bash University Live. Don't forget right now, it's if you haven't signed up, I can't believe it. Get over there. Get it done. We've got a c- tremendous crankbait package that's going to go out courtesy of Rapala with a Bash U hat. So 
Go check it out. Get yourself signed up. It's a great time to do it. This is the off season. You heard JT talking about it. He's taking like a week to work on some sponsorship stuff, and he's getting right back to it. This, if you're if you're serious about fishing, you want to get better. This is a great time to do it, even if it's nasty and cold where you live. Uh, all the content at Bash University, the training seminars will help you. All the money you can save on your tackle too. With the member benefits. With all the member benefits as well. So get yourself signed up. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks, JT Thompson.